Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. Now today I'm reviewing a book I've reviewed before. I use it regularly in court. It's an important book for the writing of opinions and the assessment of damages. And I think it's a very good indication of the shape of things to come with the Judicial College because these are the Judicial College guidelines for the assessment of general damages in personal injury cases. It includes guidance on the 10% uplift. It's now in a 14th edition and it's been, um, uh, has a, a forward from Lord Justice Irwin. Now it's been compiled for the Judicial College by the following people. Mr Justice Langstaff, Peter Carson, Stuart McKechnie, Stephen Snowden, Queen's Counsel, and Richard Wilkinson. The book comes from Oxford University Press. It's a slim volume. Everybody should have it if you're involved in PI. Um, and I've given it a title, 25 years old and more essential than ever, which is actually a quote. And that's exactly where we are with the book. Let's look at it first and then I'll do the review. There's the book itself, the front, then there's the spine. You can hardly really see anything on the spine. The, the, the way it's set out is very difficult to read some of the words, I have to say, because of the colours, the, the bright sort of orange and the white. It makes it, it doesn't make it the easiest to read at all. It's not a long book, runs to 90 odd pages. There is a short um, index as usual to the back. You, most of you will know how the book is organized. Uh, it's structured, uh, for instance, this is orthopedic industries, in, injuries. You can see it's the, the type of injury, uh, some comments and then the actual figures and then the uplift. And it gives you some indication of where you are to link into the um, case law itself. So when you're writing an opinion, you can get a reasonably good assessment. They are never very generous in this country on damages. There's the front page. But this, these guidelines are the best, best we've got. I think it has assisted uh, the judiciary tremendously. I'll come on to that in a minute. There's the information about the book itself and then the content section. You see the various contents, injuries relating, uh, resulting in death, paralysis, brain, psychiatric, psychological, senses, internal organs, orthopedic, chronic pain, facial industries, scarring, other body parts, damage to hair, dermatitis and skin and minor injuries. Then there's the, the uh, current uh, forward to the 14th edition from Irwin, which I'm going to quote from in a minute. And then there was and also something from the first edition, which Lord Donaldson um, uh, commented on, Lord Donaldson of Livington, uh, on the 25th of March 1992. It's a long time ago. Then there's the introduction to the new edition, which again, that's from Brian Langstaff, uh, dated June uh, 2017, 1st of June. And he's coming towards the end of his uh, tenure. And there's a note on multiple injuries. Then we get into the... The, the book itself. There we go. So you see, if you don't know about this book, and there's every reason to, to suppose that people watching this presentation won't know much about this book because they may be new to the area of law, um, the purpose of this book, um, of this review, is to explain the book so you know what's available because that really is part and parcel of being able to um, understand how one arrives at um, the damages figure when you do a PI case. I mean, I do PI cases on a very regular basis, and so it's always important to know uh, how we actually arrive at the figures we, we quote in the opinions, and which are then actually endorsed and <coughs> excuse me, ordered by the, um, the court itself. So what do we say? A decision some 25 years ago by what was then the Judicial Studies Board established a working party to prepare the original guidelines for the judiciary. And as Lord Donaldson said, the guidelines were not intended to represent and does not represent a new or different approach to the problem of how to assess general damages, especially where no two cases <coughs> are ever precisely the same. Now, that's the first statement. It was a brand new groundbreaking concept to have the JSB, Judicial Studies Board, now the Judicial College, publishing something like this. But the fact that they've done it and done it with other, other areas as well has made 
things much more transparent and I thank everybody involved in this because we are all meant to know what the law is and we have to find it and this is this is one of the areas where we will find where the law and practice actually exists. So today in 2017 Lord Justice Irwin writes the following in his foreword. Uh, he says that Donaldson's view is now a voice from a different era concerning the assessment of damages, the reason being that the judges now will only from time to time be called on to take a decision on assessment because it is no longer one of the commonest tasks of a judge sitting in a civil court and working out the assessment level. Uh, as I say, I generally speaking will get an agreement. I have done what we call quantum hearings where I'm going to argue and say that's not enough. Uh, but generally um, a lot of sense prevails. I do the lower the lower level of the assessment uh, of damages work but I would say a bit of sense comes into this. I have done the, the multi-million pound ones but they are much much more complicated. Let me go on anyway as Irwin concludes it's a case now that the real dispute on quantum lies elsewhere and he goes on to say that the argument as to the level of damages for pain and suffering will usually be an incidental issue in a case where the decisive matters are liability. Of course, that is basically 99% of what happens. They will dispute the liability, then, then they will have agreed the quantum. <clears throat> the nature of, obviously, the care regime is also important. Disputed contributory negligence and something more technical can quite often be the thing that, that actually is the dispute in, in the modern case. And all this is down to one factor, of course. Quote, these guidelines have operated to diminish hugely the incidence of unsettled arguments as to damages for PSLA, that's pain, suffering and loss of amenity. And the guidelines have settled the law, and I'm very grateful they have, because I think that's a, a, a good thing for us to have. It's Notice the word settled, it's not rigid, but it's settled. They've settled the law and given us an admirable service in the past, so the new edition, the 14th, continues to give us the best information available for assessments and how we arrive at them, both as counsel and, of course, uh, as the judiciary. Now, as a passing final thought, let me say this. Irwin mentions both the Jackson reforms and the proposals on whiplash. I'll say about Jackson, I'd like to see it implemented, please. If Parliament are prepared to do so, it would be nice. So far, there's been a resounding silence since he published the uh, um, second part of his report, the Jackson report, in the summer. And we're now in the autumn and nothing has happened. So please, let's have some action on that because we need to have the settled nature of the law. Not rigidity, but the settled nature of the law. And that's really what I think Rupert Jackson is offering. Moving on from that to whiplash, because both Jackson and whiplash fell victim to the dominance of the uh, Brexit matters, which Parliament and the June election have been focused upon uh, in current contemporary politics. So there, there are problems, but we've still got to look outside the Brexit mess and try and work out what we're going to be doing in other areas, because the law, the law and other act matters don't just stop because they've made a daft decision to leave Europe. Now, however, the future, of course, is catching up with us uh, all very fast and very quickly. The question posed is, will the reforms from Jackson <coughs> and Whiplash get parliamentary time? I don't think so, personally. I doubt it very much. However, we hope the answer is yes. For the same piece of uh, draft legislation will be essential for the enactment of the electronic civil court by means of the online procedurals. Now, I mentioned that at this point because it's all going to be part the next tranche of legislation before the Commons and the Lords. Now, what we're talking about here with the online procedurals are what Irwin rightly describes as an essential part of the court's reform programme. And he ends um, ominously with these words, um, and I'll quote them. Um, the cliched Chinese curse of life in interesting times sound less, sounds less hackneyed than usual. The curse of life, we live in life in interesting times, is less hackneyed than usual. Donaldson and the what was the JSB, now the college, grasped the nettle 25 years ago with the creation of these guidelines, so there shouldn't be any excuse for them to get on and, and, and carry it out. 
I'm recording this on a Friday. The House of Commons isn't even sitting and it's during the parliamentary session. You can see the problems. I know they've got constituency matters, but they have got a primary responsibility of creating laws, which I think is some, sometimes quite clearly in the House of Lords completely lost in the modern era, uh, because that's what we're paying them for. However, that's for another review. Let me end by saying, so if you and your practice need this guide, if you're involved in any aspect of PI work, we hope that this and other guides will be published by the Judicial College and OUP in the future. This one is very specific for your own practice at the moment. I'm suggesting, for instance, the online procedurals, rather than being in the private sector, so you have to buy something like the white book here, that's the equivalent of the white book for the online system, they should be guidelines which are published by the courts. Now, again, I don't know whether that's going to happen. If you look at money online claims, um, money claims online, rather, uh, you will see that, that uh, really they do need to have a huge boost. And I think that's where the Judicial College can come in. Um, I mentioned the, the business of the online course because it's actually in our written review. Uh, you're making our lives a great deal easier, members of the judiciary and all the people involved in the working parties, by creating um, this document for us as practitioners, because they're also a boon now, I think, for unrepresented parties. And notwithstanding anything we hear about legal aid, we are in an era of unrepresented parties. And I don't think necessarily that's going to go away soon. So a big thank you is um, deserved for all of the people involved in this publication. The guidelines were published as the 14th edition on the 28th of September 2017. And I'm recording this a few weeks later. It's only just come out, this book. There it is again. There and there. Now, I'm... I'm actually showing this book because it may be newer practitioners won't know much about this work. So I think it's very important to know about it. For instance, here we go. Injuries to internal organs. The chapter numbers, can I just say, have been slightly reorganised since earlier editions, um, because, mainly because they've expanded it. But this deals with internal organs, the kidney, bowels and so forth, spleen, bladder, blah, blah, blah so on. Then you get to orthopaedic injuries which is now chapter seven. All in all, an excellent book. Um, everybody involved, thank you very much indeed. OUP, I'm very grateful to you for keeping, having the mantle of, of, of the publicity, uh, the, the publication rather of this book under your, um, your wing. Um, and, uh, you know, please do think Judicial College about producing other books like this, because I'm sure that will reduce court time dramatically. Thank you to all. Bye bye.